اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم قل ان تخفو ما فی صدورکم ما تبدوه یعلم اللہ و یعلم ما فی السماوات و ما فی الارض واللہ ولا کل شہن قدیر یوم تجد کل نفس معاملت من خیر مذرا وَمَعَامِلَتْ مِنْ سُوءُ تَوَدُّ اللَّهُ أَنَّ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَهُ وَمَدًا بَعِيدًا وَيُحَذِّرُكُمُ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا وَاللَّهُ رَوْفٌ بِالْعِبَادِ قُلْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبَعُونِ يَحِبُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ واللہ غفور رغیم قلتی اللہ والرسول فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ Say whether you hide what is in your breasts or reveal it, Allah knows it and He knows whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth, and Allah has power to do all things. Beware of the day when every soul shall find itself confronted with all the goods it has done, all the good it has done, and all the evil it has done. It will wish there were a great distance between it and that evil. And Allah cautions you against his punishment. And Allah is most compassionate to his servants. Say, if you love, if you love Allah, follow me. Then will Allah love you and forgive you your sins. And Allah is most forgiving and merciful. <coughs> Say, obey Allah and his messenger. But if they turn away, then remember that Allah loves not the disbelievers. I think we have already um, finished the discussion on the first verse which I have recited, Kulin Tukfu Mafi Sururikum, or Tubduho, Yalam Hulla, or Yalam Mafi Samawat, or Mafi Lard, or La Hola Kulishain Qadir. But let me find out from my notes if there is anything which has been left unsaid. Yes, I think that is already finished. Now we turn to the second verse, that is 31. Beware of the day when every soul shall find itself confronted with all the good it has done and all the evil it has done. It will wish there were a great distance between it and the evil. And Allah cautions you against his punishment. And Allah is most compassionate to his servants. <coughs> the word hadara means whatever is present and it is opposite of the word absent, exactly the opposite of it. And if you say Hazar Azadunul Makan, that somebody Zaid uh, Hazar the Makan, then it, mean, it would mean that he presented himself there. Similarly, it uh, the word uh, is used um, with regards to the thoughts. If somebody thinks of something or something happens to, uh, to uh, comes to his mind as if without his personal effort. You know, sometimes things occur to somebody 
and uh, in that case the Arabs do use the word Hadarahu, Khatara be Balahi, that is to say it just uh, occurred to him. Ahzara Shaya means he presented something, made something present, or I should say caused something to be present. Vadda, Vaddahu is uh, Ahabbahu, that is, loved something. So, exceeding desire, which is intense, is expressed by the word Vadda. Now there is one difference between the word hub and wood, that uh, hub is uh, love and vadda also has the connotation of desire, the vadda, vadda, which means somebody desired something. Hub is uh, just sheer love, as we understand in every other language too. So, you can't say, can't express desire by the word hubba, by the word hub, but you can use the word wood for expressing your desire. According, this is according to Mufradat. Al-Amad means uh, period and also distance. Al-Amad and Al-Abad, there are two Arabic words which are similar in sound as well as in the meaning. And Amad is used for a measure of time which is very long, so long as uh, it's close to Abad. Abad means everlasting. So Amad is used to express uh, very long periods of time. Again, according to Mufradat, there is a fine difference between the two words. Both are applied to express very, very long period. Sometimes the word Abad is also used for limited period, but very long. It does not always imply that uh, it is eternal. But there is one difference between Amad and Abad, according to Imam Raghib, Abad is, uh, according to him, can apply to unlimited period. Also very long period, but unlimited, which continues forever and forever. But Amad mainly applies to a period which is long and undefined. So any long period which is not defined would be expressed by the word Amad. Then again the word Rauf, which was used in this verse. According to Lisan, Rauf 
is a word which uh, is very similar in meaning to Rahma. Rafat is similar to the meaning in Rahma. So Rauf would be similar in meaning to Rahim. But in the Holy Quran, we read this about Hazrat Rasulullah Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rabil Mu'minina Raufur Rahim. So is that a sheer repetition of the same word to intensify the meaning? Or is there a distinction, some fine distinction between the two words? According to Lisan, there is a difference in the two words. It is, uh, according to him, a khasso rahma, a khasso min rahma. Now this, uh, I can't uh, follow what he wants to say. What he says is, a very strange thing, a lisan, that uh, rahmat, the, uh, rahmat is wider in application and rafat is uh, comparatively shorter in application. That is to say the region of application of rahma is much wider and of rafa comparatively limited. But with one difference that uh, Rahma can also be used in application to things which one does not like, even things which are bad. But uh, um, Rafa is only used for those things which are good and loved ones. Perhaps what he means is that Ahadrat sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is described in the Holy Quran as Rahmatul lil alameen. And everything in the universe, living or dead, is not likable, is not good and worthy of love. So perhaps this is what he means. It is much wider in application, but it also covers the objects which are not in themselves worthy of love and compassion, which are hateable maybe. But Rahma covers even them, while Rafa is only used in application to those people or things which are really worthy of love. يَوْمَ تَجِدُ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا عَمِلَتْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ مُحْضَرًا وَمَا عَمِلَتْ مِنْ سُوءٍ This is a, a sweeping statement which apparently covers everything which is uh, uh, everything which man does here according to this statement will appear before him on the day of resurrection. And this uh, is similar to the other verse, a statement in some other verse, which says that وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِسْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِسْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًا يَرَى Whoever has committed even an atom, the, the, I mean the smallest particle worth of good, he will see it. That, will, that is to say, he will uh, see the, uh, he will be given the reward of that. Whoever commits the short, smallest, tiniest folly, he will also confront that by way of punishment. Now, if you read both these verses together, the impression intensifies that there is no forgiveness, no, um, you know, question of anything ha being left out from one's actions and whatever we do will be answerable in one way or the other. 
but uh, in some other verses of the Holy Quran, the picture which is created is different altogether. Allah, Allah tells us that if you so desire, yaghfiru zunuba jamia, He forgives or can forgive one's sins altogether, entirely. And Ahadr sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has also spoken on this subject repeatedly and said that uh, if somebody, Allah wants to forgive somebody, even if uh, he has committed sins, um, you know, as, uh, so big as you can uh, uh, compare them with mountains, still Allah can forgive them. So is there a contradiction? This is the major, big, big question which uh, uh, comes to one's mind. On the one hand, the Holy Quran seems to say here and elsewhere, that even the shortest mis uh, mistake or error or crime would be uh, taken into account and the committer of such crimes would be answerable on the Day of Judgment. He will find the result of all that. And on the other hand, the mountains seem to disappear of evil if Allah so desire. So what is the meaning of this? This verse can be understood uh, in the light of another verse which, uh, in which it is mentioned that on the day of resurrection, people, when they will be presented with Amal Nama, as we call it, the, their book of act, uh, uh, um, deeds, they would be surprised. They would say, Mali Hadil Kitab La Yuhadir Sagirum Wala Kabirum Wala Sagir. La Yuhadir Sagiratum Wala Kabiratan Illa Swaha. What sort of book that is? It doesn't leave the smallest thing or the biggest, but it contains everything. So, in fact, uh, this is a recording system to which these verses point out and which doesn't leave anything out of record. According to these statements and some others, I have come to the conclusion that whatever we do or whatever happens on this earth or anywhere else in the universe is recorded. And the recording system of God is so perfect and so refined and so delicate and minute that it doesn't leave the slightest event of, that has occurred. Also the biggest event that has occurred. So that book has, uh, uh, you know, no limitations uh, on either side. The smallest can be recorded and the biggest can be recorded. Now, when you, in the light of this, when you, now you understand how the Big Bang, which occurred 20 billion years ago, was so, and this was the most enormous thing which could happen. The whole universe came into being in one Big Bang. And that event was also recorded. And recorded to a degree that still we can hear it. In, a few years ago in the Palladium in London, uh, one could go and hear the same sounds reproduced, amplified many times of course, but the same time, sound and still the temperature of that event is uh, pervading the whole universe and it is understood to be four Kelvin. The whole universe is, uh, you know, it still keeps the warm to the degree of four Kelvin as I remember, or maybe uh, it's plus minus something. But still they know the temperature is pervading the whole universe and the sound wave pervades the whole universe. Similarly, the minutest thing which you can think of which has once happened, will never disappear. And its signs will remain imprinted somewhere. So, in the light of these verses, we understand that what Allah wants to warn us against is this, 
that not only nothing hides from him, but whatever happens is kept in a record book which doesn't leave anything. So now you turn back to the verse preceding, then you understand the meaning. Kul in tukfu mafi sudurekum o tukduho yalam hullah. If you hide what is in your hearts or reveal, still Allah knows it. Now, is the knowledge enough, knowledge of God? Maybe after billions of years when the reckoning takes place, maybe if it takes place after billions of years, we have completely forgotten and there has to be some record presented before us to remind us that this is what we did. Allah knows it okay. But here, the, uh, what this verse stresses is that not only he knows, but he also keeps a perfect, everlasting record of all things. And if Allah so desires is uh, uh, um, implied in this verse, it doesn't mean that everybody would be shown that record. What it means is that potentially there lies the danger for every soul to be confronted with his record if Allah so desired. And uh, if you uh, understand it in this, uh, um, I mean, if, if you uh, agree with this explanation, then there would be no contradiction in the Holy Quran. If somebody insists, no, everyone would be confront, confronted with all the evil he has done, even if it's very small, it is the smallest omission then as far as the prophets are concerned, they also have omitted many things sometimes in their lives. This is why they are expected by God or in fact uh, um, admonished by God to say Astaghfirullah Rabbi, O God forgive me my sins. So what about them? It not only covers sins but omissions as well because the smallest thing, whatever one has committed, will be, will be made present on the day of resurrection. So it does not mean that uh, they, uh, virtually every soul would be made to, to confront the, what evil it has done or what wrongs or omissions it has made. What it means only is this, that if Allah so desires, the record would be resi ready. The record would be available. If not so, then what is the meaning of bagair e hisab If Allah so desires he can forgive people without any accounting. Without, uh, also the Holy Quran says that there will be some criminals who will not even be asked because their record would be so, you know, bad, so evil that there will be no need to question them. They would be sent to hell, committed to hell without questioning. And there would be those who would be sent to heaven without question. Hazrat Rasul Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once mentioned that Allah had told him that 70,000 of his ummah would go to heaven without question. So if that is so, then this verse has to be understood in the light of all these explanations meaning that the record would be available, but everybody would ne not necessarily be confronted. Mozara here simply means it would be present for reference and uh, not necessarily told to everyone else. Similarly, Rasul Akram sallallahu alayhi wa has uh, spoken of some very evil people whom God would whisper in their ears, to whom God would whisper in their ears on the day of judgment, that did you do this and that? Did you do this and that? So that the less should not hear. The, the purpose would be to forgive such a person. And if he's forgiven after that uh, disgrace of, uh, you know, of um, exposure of his evil deeds, before all the people of, of, of the world, 
past and future all inclusive if that is forgiveness then the punishment has already been meted out so Hazur Akram Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has uh, told us of course after having heard from God that there would be some sinful people whom Allah would have decided to forgive anyway so he will find as if finding some excuse so he would ask them whether you did it or whether you not, did not do it and what was the purpose of this and what was the purpose of that but that will be kept hidden from the rest of the world so in the light of that the maximum license you can take with this verse would be that this uh, book would be presented individually in secret not necessarily before everybody and uh, after that once one has seen whatever past one has uh, one, uh, um, one whatever past life one had led then Allah can forgive or can punish that's up to him wa yuhazzirukum allahu nafsa wallahu raufun bil ibad and god uh, warns you or cautions you against his punishment the term, the meaning against his punishment is explanatory meaning of this verse while here the verse the wording is yuhazzirukum allahu nafsahu allah warns you against him himself the punishment is not mentioned so this style is has a very special significance it's not uh, just the punishment which is mentioned god himself is mentioned as against worldly objects the fact is that uh, the situation which has been previously described is that of coercion in the name of religion somebody is confronted with uh, persecution and inquisition and people want him to change his uh, his faith otherwise he'll be punished so in th this is a reminder to him not that either way you have to be punished either by them or by me but it says what you will lose would be God you know yuhazzirukum allahu nafsa means that you should bear in mind that this is your this is going to be your loss if for the sake of punishment you uh, make a false statement against your belief this is the situation which is described and you say things uh, disparaging things against God for instance or against the holy ones if you confront with this situation it is not just the punishment which Allah reminds you about, uh, against doesn't say that either this punishment or a bigger punishment in such a state the poor man would find himself very much you know in a pitiable state that whatever he does he's going to be punished anyway so it is not a very very nice way of saying things but the way the holy quran has said is is much more beautiful the punishment is implied maybe but the emphasis is laid on the person of god yuhazzirukumullah nafsa god warns you against himself that is to say god is going to be your loss and this is exactly what the previous verse has said allah will have nothing to do with you so yuhazzirukum in this meaning is well supported by the verses of the holy quran in the very in the, in the same context you know a few verses before when that situation was described zalika fa laysa min allah fi shayn such people will have nothing to do with god then they will choose their uh, allies or uh, their um, mentors other than god 
Once they are inclined towards them, then they will have nothing to do with Allah. Allah would be their loss. So that is why the word nafsa is repeatedly used, not the punishment of God. Verse 32, say if you have, if you love Allah, follow me, then will Allah love you and forgive you your sins, and Allah is most forgiving and merciful. This is a very important verse, although of course the Holy Quran is all important, every verse of the Holy Quran is important, but so has Allah created the universe. They are flat lands, they are very important too, but they are outstanding peaks domineering mountains and awe-inspiring huge uh, uh, peaks like uh, Mount Everest and so on and so forth. So similarly, in the Holy Quran you will find ups and downs. They have their respectiveness, uh, need and beauty, but uh, in some places you find verses so, you know, jutting out and inspiring awe and uh, uh, you know, overwhelming you with their beauty. This is one of those verses. And it's a very deep verse, rich in lessons on human psychology. Kul in kuntum tuhibbun Allah fattabeuni Say, if you love Allah, then follow me. Yohbib kumullah, then would Allah love you. Wa yakfil lakum zunubakum and forgive you your sins, wallahu ghafoorur rahim and Allah is uh, extremely forgiving and merciful. Now, I have got uh, all the solution of the word hub through dictionary, but I think we shouldn't waste our time there because the word hub is very well understood by everybody. There are two things, two words, which are so well understood by all human beings, love and hate, that uh, this is perhaps the first lesson of, in emotions which a child learns, and this is the last which one can uh, ever forget. So the word hub is, in Arabic, stands for the same feeling of attraction towards an object which is experienced by all men alike and uh, they have their counterparts in every language and everybody understands the word love. So although there is a very long uh, discussion on the various usages of the word hub in various Arabic dictionaries, for the time being I am proceeding directly with the commentary of the Holy Quran without referring to these um, uh, references found in various different uh, various Arabic dictionaries, but I'll, I may turn to them later if the occasion so demands. Every religion teaches uh, love of God. That is to say, every such religion in which you find the concept of God. And everyone who belongs to a religion either positively claims or believes that he loves God. So the love of God is the very essence of religion. But if you claim you love God, how can you yourself find out that you do not? How can one anywhere in the world find out that uh, he does not love but he thinks he loves. So when you consider this possibility of people being duped in their beliefs about themselves, then you, a large expense of various possibilities opens up before you. In ordinary life, we claim we love someone and when then we find ourselves abandoning such people at times of crisis. And it so happens that for every love 
there is a threshold of tolerance. The greater the pressure and trial against that love would be, the higher would, uh, no, th th there would be a time when that threshold will be crossed over and uh, the loved one would be abandoned. This is the most important thing about love, which the Holy Quran has pointed out, and to my knowledge, no other religion has. For instance, in the, in, in the surahs, in the end chapter of the Holy Quran, it is said that on the time, uh, on the day of, uh, uh, well, that day could be some day here and some day, or some day in the hereafter, some time in the hereafter. But a period of punishment is described where the mothers would abandon their children and sisters would abandon their brothers and so on and so forth. The dearly loved ones will be no longer the preferred ones. So that is going to be the limit of trial, whatever trial Allah has in store for uh, uh, certain people. That shows that, number one, love can be measured in degrees as to how much love can stand. Now, what is love? That has to be understood, and then when we'll turn to this, this, this uh, verse, some very interesting uh, discussions would uh, ensue from that. Love is preference of one's own self to uh, so, so, uh, preference which one gives under certain situations to others against his own self. If one does it, that act is caused or generated by love. And uh, in, as a reward of that, we are uh, accustomed to getting some price of that sacrifice. So love is a preference, not a bargain, but a preference. But that preference is never without any reward. If you love someone very dearly for the sake of that reciprocal feeling of love in the beloved one's heart, you can sacrifice many material things as long as you think that your love would be rewarded by a, 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 by a corresponding uh, love on the part of the beloved ones. This is the philosophy of love generally understood by everyone. But there are time, but what is the ultimate purpose of this love? Self-satisfaction. So the love is always centered around one's own self. It is uh, sort of, it, you know, it, it, like things which rebound from a surface, which are reflected from a surface. It, your own love is reflected from the surface of your beloved one, and the purpose always remains the self-love. This is highly important. This is why when there is a direct choice between your own self and the beloved one, and if you positively see that you will have to truly sacrifice everything of your own for the sake of somebody else, then you stop over there. Don't proceed any further. So the maximum love one knows on here, here on earth is the relationship between mother and child, etc. And Allah tells us that that's not also tr trustworthy either, because a time would come when you would rather have them punished, have them be being punished, than your own self be punished. Because there, there is a confrontation, positive um, confrontation without any reconciliation between the two factors. Now you or, or him. And uh, there you know that if you prefer yourself to them, you'll no longer be loved by them. 
yet you prefer yourself because always that was the reason why you loved them. In the response you got from your beloved ones, in your own favor, was the object of your love. That is the philosophy of love. So, in love there has to be some measure of sacrifice as long as you gain something. And love has to be demonstrated by way of some sacrifice which is never in vain, which is uh, offered in lieu of something, in return for something. This is the philosophy of love. Now, if you claim you love somebody, and at the time when the sacrifice is required, you don't offer that sacrifice, then that is the test of your love, and that is the measure of your love. That is the threshold you yourself demonstrate that beyond this my love doesn't rise. So in most cases, we are duped by our loves. We think we love someone, like a beautiful child you meet somewhere and you say, oh, how lovely, I love him so much. But the moment he, begun, he begins to behave in a way that it is annoying to you, you may even slap him on the face. And you'll say, go to hell, what, are, what nonsense this is, <laughs> you see? So your measure of love is very low in that case. And it can be so low that your love can be just imaginary. Nothing more, nothing less. For instance, you love the heroes of the books you read sometimes. You love the heroes uh, which are depicted in pictures, television, etc. And you sometimes are moved so intensely that you start crying for their, for, for, for their miseries. And you're overjoyed with their gains. You're totally involved with them. Yet, if somebody says that for the sake of that hero, give me one rupee, you know, you know, perhaps you will not even part with one penny of yours for the sake of that imaginary hero because the hero was imaginary and the love was imaginary. It was just, uh, you know, a self-deception. One wants to enjoy the uh, commotion within because, uh, uh, you know, it takes you away or changes the, 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 the boredom and, you know, the, what you say, you know, continuous boredom. What's another word for this very, very good word, which I, anyway. Monotony. monotony yes. You know, you want, you want to break the monotony of life. And for that, you imaginary love someone, and in imagination love someone, and in imagination hate someone. And that is all there is to it. So when you claim you love God, how do you know that you do love Him? Why should Allah start loving you because you say you love Him? He is not an ordinary human being who is impressed by your claims. Sometimes even if you falsely claim some, that you love someone and repeatedly do so, you do, do dupe him and he begins to uh, reciprocate to a degree your claims of love. But with Allah, this can't happen. He knows that every love, if it is true, there has to be a corresponding level of sacrifice for every love. And uh, if you love Allah, the threshold of that love should be the highest because that is the most sublime love that is, can be uh, experienced by man. And this is the tallest claim in love that one can make. Love Allah is, is not an ordinary claim, it's the biggest possible claim in, in the world of love. And yet, in every religion, every, every body who adheres to religion, he claims he loves God. And uh, the answer to that love is that they say, we feel, we know we are loved by God. We have got communion and we have a very strong satisfaction within, and which tells us that we love God. So you ask any Jehovah Witnesses or any other Christian missionaries who come and knock at your door, 
what is the proof of this uh, love of yours? They say, yes, we are loved by God. What else could we require? And the proof, there is a satisfaction within. So that satisfaction can be found in fiction, in imagination, and yet there is no proof. So this is one book which deviates from the normal um, expected answer to this question. And I have, uh, uh, you know, compared the mention of love in the New Testament and in the Old Testament with the mention of love exactly in this situation. And I'll compare it in detail, then you'll find the difference. The Holy Quran does not say that but uh, we'll come to the, turn to them later. Here Allah does not say that if you love God, love the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. That's not what it said. It says if you love God, follow him. Now this is something very strange because in answer to this question, if you love somebody, the normal expected answer is, he would love you. But this answer is given later. In between is sandwiched, this condition, that in kuntum tuhibboon allaha fattabeuni yohbibkum God would love you, of course, but on the condition that uh, as a proof of truth of your love, you follow the Holy Prophet. Now we begin to understand why. Because the highest threshold that was ever raised in love for God was raised by the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him. The truth of his love is evident throughout his life. So the claim will not be accepted by God unless it is proved beyond doubt. And the surest touchstone for anybody's love for God is declared in this verse to be the uh, life of the Holy Prophet. This verse doesn't say, then follow the instruction of the Holy Prophet. Even that is not the perfect criterion, because that instruction could be understood variously and differently by different people and interpreted differently and acted upon to, to, to varying degrees. But here, Uswa of the Holy Prophet is mentioned, that you follow him, follow his example, and uh, follow him in every footstep he, uh, uh, you know, in every footstep, wherever he leads you, you should be led by him. If you do that, then God would love you. Now the question arises that Many questions arise, but one of them is, the Holy Prophet is a perfect lover. This is what it means from this, this appears from this verse. That if you follow the model of a perfect lover, the ex to the extent which, to which you follow him, your love would be proved. And to that extent, you will be loved, in recipro uh, uh, reciprocally loved by God. This is the message of this verse. But there is one thing which uh, still bothers one. The Holy Prophet was perfect. And he never committed sins. How could we do that? And how could we be loved? And similarly, immediately, another question arises that according to Christian theology, According to the Christian philosophy, anybody who has committed a sin cannot be loved by God unless his sin is washed. So even if you follow the Holy Prophet, you cannot follow him to, to a degree that you become innocent like he was. 
even if afterwards you do not commit sins, which is not possible anyway, for everybody, for anybody. But what about your past sins? What will happen to them? How would God love you with all those sins you have committed already before you started following the Holy Prophet's examples? The answer is given here in this verse. Yohbibkum Allahu wa yaghfir lakum zunubakum. Allah would love you and will forgive you your sins. Now this is something which is very special and which you do not find in the New Testament. The philosophy is reverted completely, reversed. Allah does not wait to love those, uh, I mean, and, uh, Allah does not wait until people have become innocent before he begins to love them. It is the love of God which is responsible for forgiveness of sins. Love precedes and the forgiveness of sins follows. Without love you cannot forgive. And if without, uh, uh, with sins you cannot be loved, then there is no solution, no redemption whatsoever, whatever you may do. The Holy Quran has pointed out to this very important human psycho psychology, uh, uh, very important uh, feature of human psychology. If you apply yourself, uh, if you uh, conceive yourself to be in that situation, for instance, somebody else has uh, committed wrongs against you. Will you forgive him if somebody rises who is beloved one of yours and says, because he does this to me, he is good to me, so you forgive him. And will that be the only way, means open to you of forgiveness? Why should you forgive anybody else for the sake of somebody else. Only you can do that if you love that somebody. The reason why you forgive for somebody else's sake is because you love that someone. So if you love the sinner himself, why shouldn't you forgive him? Why must you do it uh, the, 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 in an in indirect way? So this philosophy that an innocent person is required to intercede between God and the sinner is wrong, is totally false because when you apply this to human situations the answer always is that is unnecessary. You forgive someone more if you love him the more. And if you love him the less, you forgive him less. This is what happens in everyday life. You are more tolerant of the errors of your loved ones. You are more tolerant of the, uh, of the mistakes of your children and the beloveds, etc. Sometimes so much that a mother cannot see any fault in her, child, in her children. This is why they are given a free license to do anything they please. I have seen such mothers who uh, walk into your house with their children and their children play havoc with the order of your house. They throw things right and left, make uh, right and left, make noises, you know, spill water and even make water anywhere they please. And the mothers will not be, you know, disturbed. If not, they won't turn a single hair. And they sit complacently as if nothing has happened. And when any other child goes to their house, and disturbs the peace of the house much, much less than their own children do to the others, they immediately take notice. And after they have left, these guests have left, they start talking about what sort of upbringing they have, you know, they have done. Why? Because it is love which is responsible for forgiveness of sins. You don't wait until somebody has become innocent so that you love him afterwards. Love always precedes the forgiveness. So if Allah loves you, then he will forgive you. But why should he love you unless you love him? 
And if you love him, your love should be meaningful. And for that meaningfulness, you have to demonstrate it, that you're honest in your love, with sacrifices, with, uh, uh, you know, purposeful actions which prove your love. So the best possible criterion, the most perfect criterion, which has been uh, mentioned in the Holy Quran for, as a touchstone for one's love, is the conduct of the Holy Prophet of Islam. Because no better lover, no more perfect lover could be conceived. So we are given a scientific demonstration in which we can never falter, which we can never make mistakes. If we love Allah, Allah would judge us according to our following how far and how much and how truly and meaningfully we follow the Holy Prophet of Islam. If we follow his examples, then thereby we'll prove that we love Allah that much. And if we can't follow him beyond, then we'll prove that we can't go that beyond that. That is our limit. So the left, what is left out? What would happen to that? Allah immediately assures us, يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ After Allah, you have gained Allah's love by demonstrating the truth and sincerity of your love, then you should rest assured that Allah is forgiving and more he loves people, more he becomes forgiving to them. So this is what this verse has told us. Now, a world of uh, instruction is, in, is, uh, exp is contained in this short verse. As Hazrat Aisha Siddiqa told us, the uh, um, um, Seerat, how would you translate Seerat is? The lifestyle? The lifestyle of the Holy Prophet was the Holy Quran. So the Holy Quran is mentioned in nutshell here by inviting our attention to the importance of the um, model of Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, when you conceive him in your imagination, what he is, he is the living example of the Holy Quran. So in that regard, the whole, the entire Holy Quran becomes the touchstone, but as understood through the mirror of the Holy Prophet of Islam, and as understood through the practice of the Holy Prophet of Islam. This is what is mentioned here. Now I'll discuss it in a, in a bit more detail. This verse also is a wonderful compliment to the Holy Prophet of Islam in another way. You know, there are many other verses we speak of love of God and uh, the um, expectation of God from those who love him. In so many ways, at various places, and Allah says Allah loves those who uh, do this and Allah loves those who do that and Allah does not love those who do this and do that. So all that which is mentioned in detail applies to the Holy Prophet of Islam in the first instance, or this verse we has no right to be here. So there the uswa and the conduct of the Holy Prophet of Islam is described, spread over all these verses which speak of love of God and the corresponding love from Allah to such people. So wherever that mention is made, the first object of that mention would be Hazrat Rasulullah Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as through, as seen through the peephole of this uh, verse which we are discussing. This uh, picture which is created by this verse has been uh, depicted in a very beautiful 
uh, Arab, uh, 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 a couplet of Arabic verse, which has been quoted by Tafsir Ruh al Mani with regards to the explanation of this word. It says, an Arab poet says, Tasil ilaha wa anta tuzhira hubbahu haza al amri fil qiyas badiyu law kana hubbuka sadiq la atatahu inna al muhibba liman yuhibbu mutiyu. It says that you um, disobey Allah, your Lord, and yet you claim that you love him. Haza lamri fil qiyase badiyu. By my life, I swear by my life that this is the strangest thing that can happen. A strange claim. Badiyu is something very, you know, unusual and very strange. Law ka na hubbo ka swadiqal la atatahu. If your love was true, then you should have followed him, obeyed him. In al muhibba lema yuhibbu mutiyu, the one who loves someone, for always is obedient to the one whom he loves. Now this is a very beautiful couplet, but not entirely true. You never. You, you do not always follow anyone whom you love. Because sometimes the object of your love is uh, beyond your reach. You can't follow him. Sometimes the object of your love belongs to a completely different kind of uh, species. And you love such object and you can't follow him. You know, here in England, there are people who even love dogs and madly love them. So madly that sometimes they bequeath every pro all the property to the beloved dogs rather than to their near relatives, even if they are poor. So that is a so sure sign of their love. Yet they can't follow a dog. So how can you follow everyone you love. Only you can follow anyone to a degree in a very special man, to, 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 a, to an extent. Otherwise, you offer sacrifices. So, or instructions. That is all what Ata means here. So, as far as the love of God is concerned, you can't follow God in practice because you can never see God doing anything. He can never be a model for you. You can on only follow his instructions. That is the extent to which you can follow God. So if you follow God, there has to be a perfect model for you how God is to be followed. Because as I said, instruction can, can be understood differently and imperfectly as well. If you love him less, you will follow his instruction in a superficial, cursory manner and you say, yes, I have done that. Yet it would be lacking the true meaning and the true spirit. So this is why models are essential in religion. No religion can be without model. And the model has to be uh, in uh, potentials like you. In potentials, the model should not be beyond your reach, or he can't be a model. This is the reason why, in answer to if you love God, it doesn't say, then follow Allah. While in other senses, as far as the instructions of God are concerned, you find this uh, reference in so many places in the Holy Quran that you should follow Allah, atiyul lahwa atiyul rasula. But there too, with atat al atat Allah, with the obedience of Allah, you will find the mention of atiyul rasul. 
Why is it coupled? Now you begin to understand. Because in reality, everybody cannot understand how to follow Allah. Only those understand who are directly instructed by Him. Because Allah cannot be followed in every respect. Because you are different and God is different. He can only be followed to a degree and that by way of instruction or by way of expression of his attributes, you imitate his attributes and not all the attributes, some attributes can be imitated and some are beyond your power to imitate. So you can follow Allah in a limited manner and uh, if you don't have a model before you and Allah has not directly instructed you, then you will always find yourself in, uh, you know, in confusion about how to go about it. So this is why the Holy Quran says, In kuntum tuhibbun Allah, the big question rises, what we should do? We love Allah, but we don't know how to express that love. He's beyond us, he can't be seen, he can't be felt, he can't be touched. We can't offer anything to him because uh, our material things are all given by him to us. And if we return, it can't add anything to him, to, to his wealth and treasures. So how to follow him? This is a big question. Now, how to love him, that is to say, that is a big question. And there, the holy prophet of Islam comes to our aid. He says, I loved him, and God himself instructed me how to love him. So, I make the passage easy for you. You follow me, then you will follow all those who have ever loved Allah in the manner which is liked by Allah himself, in the manner which pleases Allah so much. So the answer is, Yobib Kumullah, then Allah will love you. Now there is another connotation of this verse which is also very intriguing and very interesting. Sometimes you love somebody, truly and honestly, you are ready to sacrifice anything for him, for him, but you express your love in a manner that you become more and more loathsome to the person whom you love. This is why it is said that uh, the hatred of a fool is better than the love of a foolish person, he hatred of a wise person is better and preferable to the love of a foolish person. Because some fools express their loves in a manner that they become, they always create embarrassing situations and awkward situations for the beloved one so that they end up as the most loathsome objects. So again, you know, lack of practice, lack of knowledge, ignorance as to how one should express one's love in a manner that one should become closer and closer to, to, to the object of one's love. That is also a very intricate and delicate affair. So there, again, a model is required. The Holy Prophet assures us, the Holy Quran assures us that if you love Allah and lack of knowledge how to express your love meaningfully and rewardingly is uh, hindering your way, then the easy thing for you is to follow the Holy Prophet of Islam because he is the one who loved Allah in a way that he became the most beloved one of Allah. No other person was loved more by him, by Allah. So the best thing for you and the safest thing for you is to start following the Holy Prophet of Islam and then everything you do in his imitation would gain you Allah's love. Now, when we say, when, when it is said, Atiyu Allah wa Atiyu Rasula, the word Atiyu covers both instruction and uh, imitation. In Allah, we can all, also only follow instruction. 
and imitation to a degree that we conceive of what he is and try to be like him. But that is a very limited application of the word ata. The maximum one can do is to follow his instruction as uh, demonstrated by his beloved ones. And as far as the prophet is concerned, the word atiyu covers both his instruction and his example. And there is nothing which he has ever done which to a degree we cannot do. Now these are two different things which should be understood. When the object of your love is completely different in nature, then sometimes you simply cannot follow him in the least. The areas of his practice or conduct are so different from the areas of your capabilities that you simply can't follow him. For instance, the once there was a debate between a Muslim who was an ignorant person and a Christian scholar, and this Muslim, uh, who um, I hap who happen I happen to um, to know, he was a Sindhi. He was all totally unlettered. But once he asked this question, uh, when he, uh, uh, he was confronted by a Christian um, preacher who invited him to Christianity, he said, what for should I be invited to Christianity? What will I gain? He said, you will gain everything by your love of, 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 Christ, of Christ. He said, how can I gain everything by love of Christ? If I love Christ and uh, can't follow him, what is the meaning of that love? That love will not improve my quality because I can't follow him. He said, why not? You can follow him. He said, all right, you sh demonstrate how you can follow him. He said, for instance, I love my prophet, the holy prophet of Islam. I can follow him, not to the maximum, but at least to some degree. For instance, he said, he prayed to Allah with all his love, with all his, love, all his heart, and I can pray Allah with some of my heart, if not all my heart. But I can imitate him, the, whatever he did, I can do it to a degree, to an extent. But you can't follow Jesus Christ sometimes, uh, even in the least possible manner. He said, how come it? He said, he walked uh, the, the, the rivers, the surface of water. So you, you demonstrate it. If he walked a mile, you walked a few yards, and uh, then I'll, I'll be sure that I'll gain something from following Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. You say he got ascended to heaven, so you rise to, 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 to one for long, if not uh, to the heaven, that heaven is too far away, rise to the level of this, you know, this, this roof, for instance. And then I'll, follow, I'll understand that you can follow Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. But if he's of some nature, something which is beyond us completely, he can't be a model. So model has to be a human for human beings. And uh, in, in a model, the inherent limitations are always kept in view. Otherwise, if the inherent limitations are different in one person from the other, that one person can never be a model for that, the other person. Hazrat Rasul Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became a model in everything for us. Now, this is a very vast subject and it's impossible for me to discuss everything, then I'll start reading the whole Quran and demonstrating how he became the model and the traditions in the Hadith. So it's an unending subject. But I can't leave it all together because it's a very interesting subject too. So I have taken a few illustrations here and there to impress upon you the importance of this verse and to how you can uh, enter the world of realities from the world of myths and imaginations in your love of God. It has become a science in the view of this, this, this verse. It's for everybody to measure his uh, love of God 
to the minutest degree. And it's a very scientific approach. There is no imagination, no myth involved. And Anadul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has also explained it through his instructions in many places. And when you read those instructions, you are surprised that this is not what you expected. He's talking of love of God, and as sign of love of God, he's mentioning things which are not apparently not related with love of God. Because it say, the, the, he says, Man arada an yuhibbahullahu fa alayhi bi sidqil hadithe fa adail amanate wa Allah yozi jarahu. If somebody wants that he should be loved by Allah, just his claim will not uh, stand him in any, any good stead. He should be truthful. And he should be, uh, he should uh, be trustworthy. He should uh, return the trust which is laid in him and should not uh, deprive anybody of his rights. Allah yozi jarahu, and he should not be of any discomfort or pain or, uh, you know, um, nothing or uh, evil should flow him to his neighbor. His, show, sh his neighbor should never be given any complaint from him. Now this is the, um, criterion put by Ahadur sallallahu alayhi wa of Allah's love. And now in view of that verse, when you begin to understand this instruction, you immediately know that in kuntum tuhibbunallah fattabeuni would require all this. Rasul Akram sallallahu alayhi wa gained Allah's love through, this, through these exercises, these practices. He did not gain Allah's love just like it happened. All his life was an intense life of labor in the path of Allah and of his beautification, personal beautification. Now the answer here which is, becomes apparent is that if you love a beautiful object, you have to be beautiful yourself. In what way can you be beautiful? How can you be beautiful so that he begins to love you? These are illustrations, some illustrations, how you can be beautiful in the sight of Allah. Immediately, the moment you claim, you enter a, a, a huge life of perseverance and persuasion of some noble objects, which uh, cover the entire area of human interest. So here, three demonstrations which are given to us by the Holy Prophet of Islam are uh, Sidq, Sidqul Hadith, truthfulness, is the most important thing in one to make him worthy of Allah's love. And the Holy Prophet's career, the Holy Prophet's lifestyle was built around this central, uh, central beauty. That is truth. This is why he was called Siddiq even before he was a prophet. And Siddiq is the most, unfortunately, the most essential thing which is most often forgotten by those who claim love of Allah. And you'll be surprised how much falsehood is indulged in in the world of religious people. They all claim they love Allah and they make, tell lies in the name of Allah. And they deceive others and they don't bother about this. And they indulge sometimes in, 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 in filthy falsehoods and false allegations and they don't care. And still they claim that they love Allah and they are beloved of Allah. So the most important thing has been mentioned first by the Holy Prophet of Islam. And this could not have been said by somebody who had not gone through that experience. The Holy Prophet knew that the best expression of his love to God was his becoming truthful. And the most essential part 
of a lover of God should be truth. In essence, this is the Holy Quran. And the most overriding factor in uh, everything which is responsible for the beautification of man. This is why once the Holy Prophet of Islam, when he was asked about somebody, by somebody, what should I do? I'm a very evil man. I'm, you know, riddled with, with flaws and, and, and imperfections and crimes, etc. But give me one instruction. Just ask me one thing to do and I promise I'll do that. But I can't change in everything. I can't reform um, in every way that I'm evil. It's so much for me to reform. Just give me one instruction and I'll follow it. The Holy Prophet smiled and said, all right, that is a promise. Never tell lies. <laughs> you know, be truthful. So he, they parted company and after that, when he thought of, for instance, going out at night for stealing, he said, everybody knows that I am one of, one of the thieves in the area. If in the morning they begin to ask me, even if I hide myself, if they inquire from me, was it you who stole last night? What would I say? I have promised the Holy Prophet that I will not tell a lie. So said, all right, I'll leave, leave it for tonight. Similarly, one after the other, whenever he was about to commit something, there was a possibility of his being caught or his being suspected. And the question asked whether he was responsible for this or for that. And he went through a reformation which was complete and consummate. A completely changed person. So this is how you begin to gain Allah's love. And the first lesson is so difficult, <laughs> though apparently easy that uh, if you uh, begin to examine good people's lives closely, seldom will you find someone who has not lied in his life. Seldom will you find someone whom you think he has never lied, but still perhaps he knows better and he would know that here and there in some stages of his life, he indulged in false statements, etc. If not entirely, partially. So, the uh, answer which seemed to be so small, short and easy, you know, follow me, you know, <laughs> has begun to uh, acquire importance which is, you know, like, like uh, a mountain before us. And the very first lesson which has been given to us by the Holy Prophet, how you follow me, is so difficult, but so all important too. Because if you follow this one step, the rest of the journey will become so easy for you. So Siddh is very important. You see, this is the beauty of the words of the Holy Prophet. You can recognize them, whether there is Ravi quoted or not quoted, whether there is a long chain of reporters available to you or not. They have a stamp of the Holy Prophet upon him, upon it, upon themselves, these words of the Holy Prophet, that uh, they're recognizable even in total darkness. You know, the Holy Prophet is known to be Siddiq and Amin, Saduq and Amin as well. And these two titles were given to him by the Arabs even during his childhood. He rose with these two outstanding characteristics that he was Siddiq and Amin. So when he instructs, he just doesn't instruct you casually, you know, whatever comes to his mind, he says, not the Holy Prophet of Islam. He understands the Holy Quran so perfectly, so deeply, and so totally, that all that he says has a direct bearing with some, in, 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 and direct roots in some of the uh, of Allah's words found in the Holy Quran. This is why it is said, Ma anil hawa in yuha. He doesn't speak from himself at all. Whatever he says is from God Almighty. So he knew his responsibility after Allah had disclosed this fact to everybody. 
that look here, we tell you who the lover is, who the true lover is. He's, maybe he's too humble to say it himself, but we are ordering him to tell the rest of the world. So the onus of instruction then immediately is shifted to the shoulder of the Holy Prophet of Islam. And how does he start? He starts with this. Sidqil hadith wa da'il amanate wa Allah's yuzi jarahu that he should never hurt his uh, his neighbor. These were the three outstanding characteristics of the Holy Prophet of Islam even before the prophethood. Now this is very important for us to understand. These are very high quality characteristics but also so essential that instruction from heaven is not necessary. To be a recipient of instruction, you have to have these prerequisites. So they are important as well as elementary. They were elementary as far as the Holy Prophet is concerned because before Allah had ever instructed him to be this and this and that, he had already been this. And because he was already that, so he attracted Allah's attention. Because there was a spot of beauty visible in him, which attracted Allah's attention and he chose him for further beautification. And the remaining instruction from the Holy Quran followed it in detail later on. So he pursued a course where he beautified himself further and further and further. So he did not only set a very high model for us, but also the most elementary model for us. He couldn't have avoided it. One can say, all right, why should he said be true, which is so difficult in every respect. He could have said something else, but then he should, should not have discharged his duty by you because without truth, no journey in, in the direction of Allah can ever take place. That will always be the first step. And you can't avoid it. You can't bypass it. The, by, you, the moment you bypass it, the rest of your journey would be meaningful. And you will not start moving at all. You feel, feel perhaps you are moving, but you will not be moving. So Siddh is all important. Remember this. so many um, books on the commentary of the Holy Quran which has taken, which have taken up this verse differently, but uh, not very especially, I mean, not in a manner that I should start quoting from them. So I'm look, going through the collection of these excerpts so that if anything is worthy of mention, I'll uh, share that with you. For instance, you find such references that Yohbib um, is followed by Yaqfil Lakum Zunubakum, which means that Allah loves you, stands for a promise that He will reward you, and Yaqfil Lakum Zunubakum stands that he will not punish you. Now this is as simple as that. Everybody knows that if you, somebody is loved, he will not, he will reward and also not punish him. But uh, except for the good service that they have collected the relevant traditions for us, there is not much that you find in uh, the classical commentary books. Now there is one tradition quoted from Hazrat Ibn Abbas which says that this verse was revealed uh, in the background of an incident which took place near Khana Kaaba. 
near the house of God. According to him, there were some uh, Quraysh of Mecca who were uh, bowing before, prost bowing and prostrating before idols. Then the Holy Quran, no, the, the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, addressed them and said that why do you violate the practices of your great grandfather Abraham and Ismail and why you deviate from his practices? Thereby pointing out that uh, they never uh, indulged in idol worship and in the house which, of Allah which was built by them, your great grandfathers whom you respect of course, you are violating their practices. In answer to this, the Quraysh retorted that we prostrate before these idols only to gain Allah's love. So the object remains the same. You see, the purpose is to gain God's love and this is why we are prostrating before these idols. Now, against this false uh, argument, the Holy Quran according to Hazrat, uh, the, uh, Allah, Allah according to Hazrat Abbas, Ibn Abbas, revealed this verse, Kul in kuntum that if you follow me, only then Allah would love you, not by prostrating before these idols. According to al kalabi again Ibn Abbas reported that this verse did not, got, did not get revealed uh, in view of that incident, but another incident, which uh, uh, referred to the Jews' claim, Nahnu abnaullahi wahibbahu, that we are Allah's sons and his beloved ones. That is children of God, as mentioned in, 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 in the Old Testament. Perhaps that is what is referred to. Nahnu abnaullahi wahibbahu. On this, Hazrat Rasul Akram sallam, was told by God, Kul in kuntum Allah fattabeuni yohbibkumullah. But the best explanation, if at all given by anyone, is the one which I am going to now mention. Muhammad bin Jafar bin Zubair says that this verse was in response to Christians' belief and not in response to any other belief of the Jews or uh, of the idol worshippers. They said, we uh, revere Jesus Christ and love him and uh, show him respect for the sake of God to gain Allah's favors and Allah's love. So we are not idolaters. We don't call partners beside Allah because our love of Jesus Christ is founded on our love of God. This was the claim which was made by the, Christ, by the Christians. So as a rebuttal to them, it was said that if you follow Allah, if you love God, then you follow me and don't prostrate yourself to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Now this, uh, this is so perhaps, but uh, it is rather difficult to understand the connection and the validity of this argument, so we'll discuss it in a bit more detail. A Christian could have responded by saying that why should I follow you? I have just told you that uh, I, I love God and out of love of God I also prostrate before someone whom I consider to be his son. So that is quite understandable. But I don't believe in you. Why should I start following you? 
So that would be a, a question raised which is very difficult for a Muslim to answer. I mean, what sort of argument that is? So we'll turn to that in a while. First let me hurriedly go through this list if I have forgotten anything. Now, let's turn first to the Bible, then I'll attend, return to this question again. My God, it's already quarter to nine. You know, tonight I'm moving very slowly. And, uh, my, you know, the pace of my talk is also, I can realize, very slow. The result is that I see many people just dozing off here and there because the space is perhaps uh, not something which is, you know, which is enough to keep people awake. The reason why I am doing this is because in my mind this verse is, is very, very important. This is one of the verses which right from the childhood I have loved so immensely. And I know there is so much in it that I want you to be carried along with me I turn the leaf of the stories hidden in this verse, one after the other, and I want you to be carried along. But it can't be done hurriedly. And sometimes also I am slow because the, while I am speaking to you on this verse, I hear a little, you know, like a noise of emotion, in the sense that this verse attracts my attention to another part of which previously I had not, ne never thought. So I pay my attention not only to you, but also to this new, you know, this sarsar-like voice sound, which says there is something else here. So I have to apply my mind, you know, in two directions. Constantly paying attention to the new meaning, which begin, to, which continue to appear on, on the, during the discourse, and also trying to express myself in a language of which I am, of course, far from being a master. So these difficulties have created this problem of uh, speaking, addressing you slowly tonight. But uh, I assure you that this would be worthy of reward. This would be, I mean, um, w uh, worthy of labor because the reward would be very enriching. Because this verse, as we we'll proceed further, will carry us from a beautiful domain to another beautiful domain. And this is, in fact, the essence, the very essence of uh, the philosophy of love and also the very essence of the teachings of the Holy Quran. But of that, inshallah, the rest, inshallah, we'll discuss tomorrow. No, no, I'm sorry, the day after. And uh, I'll endeavor to be short the day after and, uh, you know, to, uh, I'll endeavor in the meantime to arrange my ideas in a more orderly fashion so that I can deliver them more quickly than I have been, ab been able to do tonight. All right? So we proceed directly to the mosque from here. <laughs>